Today, I would like to discuss about toxic cultures. So that's the tough topic. And I want to discuss in particular about why it is so difficult to talk about toxic cultures. So speaking up about the type of culture or negative practice at work is one of the best way to create positive change. This is something that we all know. So, but the question is why are so many people reluctant to open up and speak up about whatever negative practice is happening uh, in their work? There might be some, some different reasons. First, there might be significant personal or professional risk associated with being like speaking up or being like a whistleblower. Or another one is about many people assume that someone else is going to speak up <laughs> or that is not the right context to talk about it. For this discussion, I needed to have a rebel mindset about toxic cultures. And I have as a guest, Zoe Fragu. By the way, Zoe, uh, when I was preparing for this episode, I, I was thinking about that in 2018, there was a famous case that happened in Nike, the company, where women were talking about harassment. And I remember, if I remember correctly, the setup, it was like nobody cared about, uh, about women harassment back then. And a group of women started like doing a survey with other women uh, asking them about if they had uh, any experience with the harassment at work. And in fact, little by little, they were collecting a lot of information about other similar cases. And that made me think about how difficult it is to uh, start talking, speaking up about toxic cultures if you don't feel like there is other people that are jointly uh, talking about it. It's, it was it is quite impactful in fact thanks to the night case there was at least 15 different executive profiles in, in the company who were kicked out of the company or disappeared of the of the org chart now let me get back to the about uh introducing zoe uh she's an organizational psychologist she's kind of a fixer of toxic work cultures she uses science to help organizations transform their culture and she also does research that is mainly focused on the psychometrics of the of corporate cultures. Uh, psychometric, it means basically how do we measure something that it looks at sometimes a little bit subjective, but there is science behind. She writes and speaks about equality in the workplace, stereotyping, mobbing, burnout, leadership, toxic positivity, positive psychology. Well, that's what makes Zoe the type of person that I would like to discuss a little bit more about toxic uh, work cultures. Uh, Zoe, I wanted to understand, is there any personal reason be, uh, behind the fact that you have got that interest in uh, in work culture? Is, is something in particular an experience that made you think, hey, that's the reason, that's the direction where I want to go? Uh, well, I'll tell you, Ivan, the thing is that uh, I don't think that there is any person in the world that has been working uh, for at least five, six, seven years, and they've changed some companies, and they've never been a victim of toxic work cultures themselves. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when I started my career, I've, I've also been in at least two or three companies where the environment was toxic, and it didn't help me flourish, it didn't really help me grow. If anything, it was making me feel like I, I should be guilty about everything, and that uh, something is wrong with uh, my demands or something is wrong with my motivation, something is wrong with myself. Therefore, uh, having studied psychology and already having a more business approach on the subject, I started thinking, okay, but this thing has to change at some point. We, we need to speak up. What's going to happen? And then the time was passing by and millennials were the first ones to start bringing up issues like mental health and equality in the workspace. And now we even have Gen Zs that not only do they bring it up, but they might actually protest or stop going to the work and they don't care even if they don't have any job, as long as the job is not what they really want in this life. And at that point, I realized that in the future, and this future is not very far away, corporations will have to change, will have to become healthier, not necessarily because they understood that something's wrong with the concept of corporate, corporate culture per se, but because they won't be able to find employees anymore. So having said that, the reason I started occupying myself with this matter is not because I necessarily had a lot of faith in uh, companies, but I did have a lot of faith in people that they will drive the change forward. You, you say something that is quite interesting. So that 
the main reason why it could it, it has become or it will become uh, important is related to talent attraction. Talking about talent attraction. So today there is a lot of like kind of aggregators of reviews of companies. But what is happening very often that if we think about Glassdoor, Indeed, this website mm -hmm. where we can find a little bit of the comments about what is wrong with uh, so many companies, uh, what happens is that very often this is, these are the type of comments that you get after the fact, like when you are leaving, because while you are still in the company, you don't dare to go and talk openly about what is happening in your in your company. Do you feel like that? Is there any specific reason why it is so so difficult to speak up while you are in a tox, uh, toxic culture? Because usually cultures are always uh, top down. So therefore, the culture in a company is not irrelevant to the management of the company and to the leadership of the company. Therefore, if a culture is what we perceive it to be toxic, is because there are people that have chosen to empower this kind of culture. So it's more possible that we are not a fit than they're going to actually do a change because we are not matching this particular culture. And we always need to keep in mind that when we talk about cultures, there's not necessarily what we say toxic might be very arbitrary. It might be our personal view on a culture. Uh, it's capitalism. At the end of the story, it's does it work? Doesn't it work? So if it's functional and the company somehow exists and they're producing money and they're doing well, then probably we are not a fit because there are people that are doing great in this company and they really like it. Mm. So the same trait that a person can be considering toxic for someone else might be their modus operandi. Mm. So, but but you said it in fact that generations uh, are changing. Uh, I mean, their perception about what is toxic has, has changed. So we think about Generation X. So we took a job because of money and maybe a status, right? But now you talk with a Generation Z who has like money in the number five or number six of priorities of choosing for choosing a, a company. And there are other things that are more important, including the, the possibility to, to have inclusion of the that their voice is, is heard, possibility to have a balanced uh, balance life. So the, the drivers to choose for, to go for a company have, have changed drastically. So is there a, uh, is there a possibility for, uh, for companies to pay more attention to what is, uh, what is happening in their, in, in their organization? Otherwise, they are going to miss the opportunity to attract the, the, the right talent. Yeah, but you can't really go far away from what you know. And that's why we have this, uh, right now, at uh, this era, we have this kitsch phenomenon of many corporations trying to embrace new trends, but without actually embracing them. So they do, and they bring even people like me, and they do speeches, and they do activities trying to, uh, you know, follow up on these changes that are happening around the world and follow up on these trends. But at the same time, no real change is happening. And they say they are talent-oriented, but they still keep being uh, seniority-oriented. Mm. So I wouldn't say that we're there yet. I would say that we are in between where we start realizing that some things need to change, but we don't necessarily yet know how to change them. Or sometimes people are not ready to change themselves. That's also mm. something that I see very often. They come to me and they say, perfect, we need to change this thing. But they don't realize that the change also evolves them. Mm. They just want everyone else to change. Exactly. And, and that is something that I have also realized. And sometimes the higher you are in the hierarchy, uh, the more you don't realize what is happening in for most of the employees. And the more you feel entitled when you, you create this accumulation of power to behave the way you want, because it has been working until now. So it's more difficult to change people at the top than change people at, at the bottom of the, uh, of the organization. Uh, Zoe, what would be your personal definition of a toxic culture? Okay, it will be personal because like I said, uh, something that for one person is toxic for someone else is the way they're you know, operating and the way they're just existing in the workplace. So for me, for example, a culture that empowers competitive, competitiveness and inner competitiveness, uh, that's something toxic. And usually it also comes along with the comments about you know, you need to share your knowledge or you need to mentor. But people can't really do that. They're scared. 
when on the one hand you tell them to be more competitive and you push them to be more competitive and at the same time you tell them to share their knowledge this is a double bind they don't know what to do because they're afraid that if they share their knowledge you're gonna replace them with someone cheaper or someone younger mm. so i would say com- competition inner competition is one issue and giving information that are not matching the company's actions that's another issue anything that has to do with uh, lack of self-awareness in, in the vision of the company, like we're running a change, but nobody knows why we're running it or who's going to be benefited. All these things that create um, anxiety, I mm. would say. All these things that create anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing is that the brain doesn't like uncertainty. So when we have anxiety, we have a stress and God, we cannot we cannot be productive. We cannot be innovative when we are fearful of the change. And as you said, it hasn't been well communicated with a, in a transparent manner. And on top, you have to play with your elbows uh, in order to to compete instead of having a, a more collaborative approach or on the things that are, that are, are meant to be the, uh, delivered in the in the workplace. Yeah. Right. Is there a way, in fact, to quantify um, how healthy or how toxic is a corporate culture? And I'm telling, and I'm asking you that in particular because I know that you are devoting uh, maybe a, most of your time doing research. And I wanted to understand if 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 there is a way to measure it that people can understand that, that if it, how my personal company is positioned versus others or what is going wrong is, is, is specifically in an organization. Can we quantify mm-hmm. that? For starters, there are a lot of uh, tools that measure corporate culture. There are a lot of uh, quantitative tools like questionnaires that are taking also into account, for example, culture difference in a workplace or even sex difference in a workplace. So there are a lot of questionnaires. Even my PhD has to do with the development of a qualitative tool. What I'm doing is I'm creating a guide for semi-guided interviews uh, that depending on the outcome, you get information about the corporate culture. So the issue I would say usually is it's not about quantifying the toxicity of the workplace, but the fact that leadership, when they ask, when you ask them about what your culture is, what they're going to tell you is not necessarily what applies. So you need to go one step behind before asking me about do do companies know that their culture is toxic? You need to ask me if they know what their culture is. And that's usually the issue. Mm. Yeah. They don't. They will tell you that this is important in my culture. And then my measurements or another researcher's measurements might show that this doesn't apply at all in your company. And actually, these are the traits that are important in your culture. Okay. So, but... It is possible then to to have a model that quantifies because sometimes people believe that culture is something like subjective, no? And you mentioned also that it can be subjective the way I perceive the culture because I'm a winner and and it fits well with my co- the competitive mm-hmm. exactly. workplace. Um, but can we quantify? Uh, and maybe that's one of the. Uh, one of the things that are, is not working currently in our society is that there is no single way to measure how toxic we well, are other than the, the comments. i tell you, we have some passive ways to measure it. For example, one very, very good sign is uh, a trait we call absenteeism. That has to do with how often people don't show up for work last minute because they claim that they're sick. Or So what this actually shows is that people, they don't have the courage to wake up from their bed and come to the office in the morning. And this is a very bad sign. If you score high in absenteeism, that means that you have a problematic work environment because people don't want to come. Then another sign is retention. If your retention is low, which means that every year you need to change again, 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 employees because they're coming, they're going, they're coming, they're going, that also shows that you have a problem with your culture. And then the third thing is organizational commitment. How much the people that work for you actually feel committed in the organization and they feel like the organizational vision is their vision as well. And they gain pride by working in this organization. So we might not have necessarily a toxicity tool to measure how toxic it is, but we have other elements that we can calculate and understand if the uh, environment is healthy or not. 
Hmm. Uh, wh what I like about your comment is that, so there is many companies today that are already measuring having this poll survey, like quick surveys that in order to assess commitment, engagement of employees. Uh, but what I have the feeling is that uh, that these insights are not really transformed into actions for many companies. It's either too long or too complex, or they are afraid that to invest so much or to give so much because sometimes they feel like we shouldn't be giving too much to employees because then they're going to be asking for more. Um, so what is your feeling about that? Do, do you think that companies are really acting on, on surveys, on, on assessments? When they believe that the results of the surveys are going to create a financial problem or they're going to give leverage to the competition, yes, in my experience, they act. They don't necessarily act on uh, results that don't translate to specific KPIs, that they don't translate to specific actions that are going to affect the company's presence as a profitability center. <laughs> but and, and the companies that do act and maybe they they care a little bit less about what shareholders are going to think or what what is going to be the the opinion uh, uh the public opinion about the, the company but they they take an action uh have you noticed why they do it the companies that do act yeah well it depends because every every case is not the same there are even for example in greece last year uh, it was voted a law from our par parliament that companies are now obliged to have uh, prevention mechanisms and run trainings about mobbing, about harassment, harassment in the workplace. Therefore, that has made a lot of companies to start seeking for experts that will help them prepare this kind of actions. On the other hand, another case might be that in a specific company, there was an incident. Uh, there were a lot of uh, burnout victims or there were a lot of harassment cases therefore usually something happens the fact that especially for, for these kind of issues of mental health or equality for a company to just you know wake up a day and start carrying out of nowhere it's a little weird or strange uh another thing that might happen is a difference in succession like the previous boss left the building and now we have a new one who is more progressive or who cares to bring in the corporation new values Another very often phenomenon is mergers and acquisitions, buyouts, where another company brings inside uh, her new culture or her own culture. And they need to run trainings or change in order to make sure that the two companies will get along. It is almost like there has to be a crisis in order to act on, on that. But, and as you said, it, uh, companies do not have the full information about the impact of absenteeism, which is a driver of cost for many companies. And usually they have been quantifying mental health issues by the number of people who are not coming to work because they are sick for sick leaves or they are leaving the company. But instead of that, they don't measure the, the fact that there are many people that can be showing up at work and not being productive and being in front of the, of the, the laptop. So not working at, the, uh, at, at their best. And that is a quantifiable uh, element that has an impact in the, in the financials of, of a company. And in fact, it has become the number one driver of impact of in, in mental health <clears throat> challenges. Um, when we are talking about, <clears throat> there has been a lot of talk about the impact of positive psychology uh, in order to improve or uh, the work cultures, to understand humans, how they can thrive at work. Um, how can we make sure that we are not like overdoing it in terms of talking about happiness, well-being of, of people? And, and at the end, it doesn't become like kind of a toxic contributor because we are talking about it too much and, and we are over-exaggerating about that. How can we make that Positive psychology doesn't make doesn't contribute in terms of toxicity because if we use it too often, uh, it it may not contribute well in in a in a corporate culture. Uh, in general, positive psychology is very helpful, and the the idea that you need to find the opportunity in every crisis is a very healthy idea because it helps you be more results focused and more more uh, orientated in change and orientated in 
how can I create more and how can I grow even if the environment's not helping me? So as a general concept, by default, it's helpful. The problem is when it stands in the way of validating one's true emotions. And when it starts becoming, when does it start becoming toxic? When a person can't anymore acknowledge their true feelings because they feel that they are obliged to always be positive, even if they're stressed or Mm. if they're sad, they push themselves to not acknowledge what's happening and instead just pretend that they're happy and everything's going great. So that's when it becomes toxic. When... I start feeling that it's not anymore my responsibility to reflect on my emotions and find a way to manage them, but even more to hide them and ignore them completely and pretend that they don't exist. Hmm. So kind of the what you are proposing, in fact, it is that we need to be able to acknowledge these, these emotions and kind of make the choice how to react about that, but we cannot ignore them and park park them, or at least we need to have the the choice of saying, do I show them if I'm angry about what is going on or not? Positive psychology is not about saying that, uh, oh, I'm very happy right now. No, I'm not stressed at all about uh, the fact that the company has so many layoffs. No, I'm not stressed at all. Everything's going great. Positive psychology is, okay, I am stressed right now, but even if I lose my job, I know that I'm capable to find another job Hmm. because I believe in myself. And as a matter of fact, I can go and ask them right now or I can start planning anyway. So positive psychology has more to do about how I manage my emotions than about the ability to change my emotions or deny my emotions or reflect from my emotions. Hmm. So let's do an exercise of just to project ourselves. So imagine that you have a magic wand and you have all the resources, people, the money to change the way toxic work cultures are, 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 are doing. So what are the actions that you, that you would do if you needed to change work cultures and you have everything that you need? Money, resources. Okay, so again, personal opinion. I hate silos, so the first thing I would break is all hierarchy silos. Like, okay, of course, there needs to be a leader because somebody has to propose their vision, but proposing a vision is so much different than enforcing a vision or patronizing. So Mm. I would break silos. I would make uh, communication open, and uh, I would be fully transparent. I would like cultures to be fully transparent when it comes to information, when it comes to salaries even. Why not? Why shouldn't the person know how the other person is uh, getting uh, compensated so that they can, you know, project themselves and understand what they're doing wrong or what they're doing right and ask for extra information. Then I would also invest a lot in training, in team building and sensitivity training as well. So that even minorities and uh, feel uh, that are seen and feel respected. And then I would uh, do something like, I don't know, creativity days where people are open to just speak without feeling uh, exposed and without feeling ashamed and sharing ideas in an open environment, brainstorming all together. So basically, I think I would turn I would turn corporations into schools, but not like the kind of school that are preparing for exams, but more like kindergarten, where we're all together, we have fun, we create something at the same time. Everybody can do their own thing. Someone is drawing, someone is reading, but we're also all together here trying to make the year pass. That's great. And I like the fact that that you say like school because, okay, the educational system is helping us to acquire knowledge, maybe to acquire certain processes of thinking, like I'm an engineer, so analytical thinking is something that I, I, I could potentially master. But... The funny thing is that today, um, learning has been duplicated from the university to um, corporations. And corporations, what they need, in fact, and you mentioned a a, a couple of sensitivity trainings, for instance. It's not something that you will learn by reading some some slides or by practicing with an e-learning. You need to, in fact, put it into practice. And so the way we learn in corporations should be changing so that it is more adapted to the to the practice rather than the acquisition of knowledge because it doesn't help me to have all the theory behind emotional intelligence 
if I have never, I will never put it in practice because it became too complex and it was delivered in a in a classroom without any possibility to to share experience and have feedback on how I'm doing, right? So mm -hmm. that's one point. And I love your idea about breaking the breaking the silos because at the end, people want to belong to somewhere, to, to be like in a family or like in a tribe. And when you have a flat organization where everything is transparent, that you know, like, as you say, that there is that salary for that person. And you know what, why he's getting that is because of this responsibility so that I can mime. And today, most of the corporations are hiding or not communicating information. And that makes also... Uh, increases the level of uncertainty for people because we don't know what is the role model that needs to be followed in order to be thriving at work to be uh, to uh, and to be deserving even more uh, more compensation if if required. Uh, and I like also, of course, the idea of that self actualization that the, the fact that we are we can learn stuff and we can learn stuff not only that is technical for work but it is something for for me as a person that I I can use some of the things that I'm learning also outside uh, outside of work. So that's something that I find it quite po positive, in fact, in, in great working cultures. Um, I know that, that there has been already some, uh, some companies working on this idea of full transparency, especially about the salaries. I, I, I heard the name, but I don't remember exactly which company was, was doing it, that mm -hmm. of communicating the full salaries, which is something quite positive. Zoe, so if I'm leaving it, the pain, in fact, of being in a, in, a, in a toxic culture, what do you think I should be doing? So I'm unhappy. I'm in a toxic culture. Uh, and maybe I'm a little bit afraid of not speaking up because of different reasons that we, that we have discussed. What should I do? What actions would you recommend uh, mm -hmm. in order to move forward? Okay, first step I would say is acknowledge your emotions. If you're not feeling happy there, you need to understand that you're not feeling happy there and that it's not going to get better. It's probably going to get worse. Then the second thing, and I think that this is the part where people end up losing a lot of time when it's coming to decide whether they need to stay in an environment or they need to change their work, is that I spend a lot of time analyzing why I'm right and they're wrong and why I have like, a moral ground in the situation, and I shouldn't do that. It doesn't even matter and it won't help me. Let's say you're right, let's say you're wrong. Let's say that most probably it's just not a fit, like I said in the beginning, because somehow this company, they're there, they exist, and there are people that are happy there. So it's more probable that it just doesn't suit you than that it's a completely pathogenic environment that, and everyone needs to go in prison. So, and that goes also for personal relationships. We need to train ourselves to understand that it's okay to leave just because we want to leave. Mm. We don't have to make the other person or the company or the environment be awful or destructive or pathogenic or put labels so that we, are, we have the right to leave. We have the right to leave anyway, just because we're not happy there. And then the third thing is that organize its strategy. Where do you want to go? Do you have a plan for where you want to go? If being at that company right now is something that's helping you with your future plan, then maybe you need to stay and you just need to understand what's the difference between this is toxic, this is not me, so maybe I should just distance myself more because the five things that I'm getting from here and these lessons, I need them. So first I need to really get them and then I can go. The fact that we don't belong somewhere uh, forever and that it's not our, let's say, ideal career, it doesn't mean that it's not an ideal step and that we don't have lessons to learn. Does this make sense? It, it, it does. Uh, and it made me think about disability or disability from the brain to guess correctly the future. So we always think that the future is going to be more messy uh, than is going to be in reality. We always have the expectation like, oh, if I leave my work, I'm, I'm going to be financially like broke and my family is not going to like me and my wife, my children are not going to have everything that I need. So we always expect that this big change is going to be worse 
that is going to be in re the reality. Um, and especially yeah, another, about finance, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, also. But another thing I would like to mention is that uh, it also works the other way around. So I have a lot of clients that come to me uh, for coaching and they start by saying, I need to go, it's a toxic environment, I need to leave. And then they start describing what they're going through. And well, it's, there's no one hitting them. There's no one cursing on them. There's no one stealing from them or stealing credits from them. It's just that there are people that might be more competitive, but people that are more taking more place in the room or people that are disrespectful. And then we need to understand that these kind of people are everywhere. So changing a job is not going to help you because most of the corporations, they have people that are exactly like that because corporate culture by default reinforces these kind of personalities. Therefore, it's important to make sure that when I want to leave, I've learned everything I have to learn. So when I go to the next place, I know how to position myself so I don't find myself in the same place again. And I've solved this. I don't have to go through that again. But many people, they just leave before taking these lessons. So what they're actually doing is they always have the same experience. The only thing that's changing is the name of the company. Hmm. Indeed. So working on this level of self-awareness is quite important in order to take the, the decision, right? To understand, is it a non-fit? Is a good culture, but I'm going to find something uh, something else that uh, it might be similar somewhere else, uh, then I have to work on myself. It can be that really we are in a toxic environment and then maybe it is a good decision to, to, to leave because change takes time. Like certain corporations, when they want to change their culture, it takes like five, 10 years to change because it, if it is already as an individual, very difficult to, I don't know, to change certain rituals, like having a healthier lifestyle is already like painful for us. So imagine at the level of a corporation, it is it takes a, a, a long time, right? Yes, of course. But also, there are three cases, okay? So one is that the corporation is a very toxic environment. That's very rare, because if it's so toxic, after a while, the corporation wouldn't exist. But let's say that you happen to be there in a corporation that's somehow making it and it's very toxic. Then the other possibility, which is the most often, by far the most often, is that it's not a match, it's not a fit. Mm. And the things that I find toxic, for them they're okay and they're functioning, but it doesn't suit me or the other way around. And then there's a third option that, and we need to understand that as well. Sometimes we are the problem. The fact, I had a training like some weeks ago in the company about mobbing and harassment in the workplace. And when I finished the training, the most difficult and problematic of the management team, who was actually the reason, the main reason why the company was having this training, he came to me and he said, Zoe, thank you so much. You really helped me today because I just realized that they're bullying me and they're putting labels on me. So many, many times we need to understand that if we've been to one, two, three, four toxic environments, maybe it's not the environment. I mean, still, it's okay. But being able to see the truth is important in someone's growth. Zoe, is it difficult to change cultures? Um, eh from a cultural perspective. So I know that you have been working with companies in Europe and even today you are still having one of your customers who is Indian based, right? One of the- like Yeah. A, um, and also some weeks ago, I was actually in Dubai for a client. Yeah, exactly. We should have met. <laughs> exactly. Um, so do you see that it's more difficult with certain cultures to, for, uh, to change or is the same, it is the same patterns replicate uh, and that's okay. Uh, change is difficult for everyone. Uh, and it's not just the, think about it, it's not just the organizations, it's about even personal change. People, mm -hmm. we have this uh, internal uh, mechanism that's called homeostasis and has to do with maintaining our internal environment steady. At the same apply for corporations, they have the tendency to maintain their internal environment steady. So in general, change is very difficult for humans and for uh, organizations. What I do find working with uh, different cultures as well is that uh, where they're orienting, their orientation is very different. In uh, Asian cultures, for example, there is more of a sense of duty and more of a sense of community. While yeah. in Western cultures, it's more about individualism and it's not about, it's more about assertiveness and personal growth. Uh, 
like I said, some weeks ago, I was in um, the Emirates and stuff that have been in the center of attention for Europeans, like sustainability, for example, or for uh, equality in the workspace. It's still uh, something very, very, very far from being the center of attention at the Emirates yet. They're more, you know, oriented in completely different stuff like innovation or technology. Mm. So I guess that when we are going into a, a, a change of culture, we need to, to take into consideration the context of the, the base of the, uh, of the company in order to maybe leverage in certain things that are traits, like if we talk about the, the feeling of community for Asian, uh, Asian countries or the, the feeling of being a family or the paternalistic approach, we can sometime, somehow leverage on that in order to accelerate the, the change of cultures. Is that correct? Yes, as long as we can find uh, the appropriate change agents that will help us implement this vision, sure. But we need still to understand that, especially when it comes to corporations, culture is still always top down. So if you don't have management support, and if management and leadership are not the first ones that support actively this change by being and leading by example, then there's no way change is going to happen. And that's why I would say more than 90% of the culture change programs are failing right now. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And I have seen it for, uh, or with my own eyes, uh, that the fact that if the senior management doesn't change, because we have a tendency, in fact, to look up to what others are doing. And so if we see somebody not my, not doing the behaviors that they claim, so we think that it's safer to align with whoever has has the power rather than following something that is in a website these are our values and behaviors that we need to apply so it's safer to to follow the uh somebody in power um what would you say is the common mistakes that organizations that want to change their culture either because of toxicity or because it is normal to, to, to refresh, to, to be more innovative or to have a certain level of agility that they, 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 that they want to achieve. What are the common mistakes into the implementation of, the, uh, of, of this cultural change? Okay, there are many different things that can go wrong, but I'll tell you the, the most uh, recent, not the most recent, sorry, the most often ones, the most frequent. Uh, one is that they don't have a clear vision of what the change is going to be about. Two, they don't communicate this vision so that people are know, uh, know what to expect. Then the third is that they don't make sure that people are trusting that the leadership is in, in a place where they can actually drive this change in a successful way. Four, they don't make sure that the people have the skills to support the change. Hmm. So I would say that these four factors are the most usual that condemn a change in a culture. Absolutely. And, and very often we see that when organizations are, are working in, uh, on changing their culture, they stop at the level of values. And the, the funny thing is that values is not something relatable for individuals. So if you tell me about what is collaboration, well, my interpretation of collaboration will not be the same as uh, as as yours. And, and 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 I have the impression that the fact that they are stopping at defining just values with a, maybe a, a definition without going at the, at the level of behaviors that are, are going to be encouraged makes it a little bit like you mentioned it as 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 lack of communication, but it, it is more. It's lack of of something tangible that we can really yeah. common common definitions like when we say one thing we all mean the same i'll tell you another example so i was running a, a, some culture interventions in a company and when i initially asked them about tell me about your culture so what are your values they said some things and they said teamwork okay i said what do you mean by teamwork we always help each other even if i finished my work there's no way i will leave i will stay behind and help my colleagues uh, with their jobs okay i said nice then I started getting to know them better. I did some interviews. I did some interventions. And what was happening is that they didn't have any teamwork for starts. They were very competitive. They were gossiping a lot. So if somebody was left behind at the job, the others would be very judgmental. Or if somebody was doing a mistake, they would be very judgmental. But they did stay behind to help each other. So what they were perceiving as teamwork was actually consciousness. 
And there was also a sense of job duty. They loved their job per se, so they didn't, they were very client centered, so they didn't want to be exposed to the clients. And that's why they were staying behind, not because of collegiality, but because of a sense that I need to do well for my clients. And mm. since I'm part of the team, my name is also on this uh, door, so I will be exposed as well which is completely different. And it changes completely the narrative of how to interpret this kind of culture and how to work with this kind of culture. Hmm. Okay, so that makes it even more important to have, as you said, like a, a, common, defin- a common understanding of wh- what it could mean because there is different ways to achieve like a, a, a value, but there needs to be like a certain pattern that, the in- that encourages, in fact, this motivation uh, Kind of the more the intrinsic motivation to achieve this personal uh, personal value and represent it through behaviors, actions that are that are understood across the uh, across the organization, and maybe sometimes <laughs> companies also forget to reward or talk about these behaviors that are that are, are being done that protect the culture, the new culture of uh, of the organization. So they they will tell you collaboration is important. But it's not something that is rewarded. So competition is 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 still part of the of the theme, even though it's not part of the values, the core values that they want to uh, change in the in the in the future. Mm-hmm. And that's why we need to be able to understand the difference between what they say they want and what they really want. And that's why these kind of projects, personally, I always encourage that they should be led by an expert, which is their job, so that they can guide leadership. Otherwise, it's very often do everyone, for starts, if you ask them, everyone will tell you, what do we want our culture to be? Client-centered, uh, innovative, creative, teamwork, and uh, I don't know, loyal. But it's a little bizarre because these five values, there's no way that they reflect the 95% of the corporations. Mm. And that's okay. That's okay. Variety is an amazing thing. And we should be celebrate variety but always under the prism of self-awareness, even in an organizational level. Hmm. Uh, is there any way, in fact, to accelerate ch- the change of culture like uh, through the use of technology? It, it, can technology really help to, to uh, scale up change in, uh, in an organization? So instead of the usual five to 10 years to change a culture that we can reduce this, uh, this change to one year because technology is there. Well, personally, I'm a big fan of technology. Uh, I, I love it. I could be speaking about how metaverse is going to transform diversity and equity uh, for, forever, if you want. Uh, but there are, of course, many, many tools that we can use. For example, there is gamification now, and especially gamification in psychometrics is very interesting. So there are a lot of technological options that will help a culture change not only in the sense of uh, measuring, but also for trainings, and if you also want to, want to take it one step further, there's also blockchain. So by tokenizing, for example, trainings, that can give extra motivation to people to help you with the change. Mm. So of course, there are nowadays there are extreme options. That's super good. Uh, Zoe, I, I would like to thank you very much because I, I, I have the impression that I have learned quite a lot on, on, on this discussion. <laughs> but um, so, and I understand that it is, possible to reach you out to have a little bit more of if we have questions about toxic cultures about all the topics that we that we have mentioned in terms of changing leaderships uh burnout that, that is a, a topic that is quite quite dear of, uh, for me how to measure uh how to measure measure change so it is possible to reach you out in your linkedin profile so we have to search for zoe z o e fragu F R A J, no G O U, uh, or in your website. By the way, I'm going to put the, the, your website below the comments of, of this uh, of this episode. Uh, is there anything, any other way to reach you out, Zoe? I'm, uh, you know, a classic millennial, so I'm very active in almost all of the social media. And if you check my website, you'll even find my Telegram. So feel free to reach out in whatever way it's uh, easier for you guys. I'll be happy to continue the discussion. Thank you, Zoe. It was wonderful to discuss culture at work with you. Thank you so much for having me.
Thank you. Bye.